Um, I don't know that anyone is over there. Feel free to step away and get yourself some food if you want to. Please feel free to come up and get some cold water. We've got cups here. And it is summertime, and we've got some um, popcorn bags for you to take home because, you know, everyone needs a movie night every now and then. Please help yourself to that. So go ahead and just uh, take your seat. And, uh, yeah, I don't see any other people walking over this way. Gary, are we in a good position for you? Okay. Thank you everyone for being here. Those of you in the sun, feel free. There's plenty of shade over here if you want to migrate because that sun's just going to keep on creeping this way. So I'm, um, I'm Amy Peterson O'Brien. I'm the president of the uh, Cahaba Homestead Heritage Foundation. And I want to thank everyone for being here today. I want to especially thank two of our city council members who are here. We heard from the others and from the mayor. They were out of town this week, so thank you for making the effort to come out. And thank all of you for taking the time to be here. We are a pretty new uh, foundation, just uh, found incorporated a few months ago. Um, uh, we've, I hope some of you have seen uh, our social media presence and our website, which is a, a great educational resource. And I want to thank our histor uh, historian, Gary uh, Lloyd, uh, for, for really uh, providing that resource for us and for our neighbors and for the city of Trustful. Our vice president is Kathy Prince, if you want to stand up and say, hey, Kathy. Our secretary is Kathy Freeman. Again, our historian, Gary Lloyd, and Meg Ward, Margaret Ward, is our treasurer. So today I'm excited to have a guest speaker here. So as a, as a nonprofit organization, we are first and foremost an educational resource. And we exist to promote, perpetuate, and enhance the value of the Cahaba Project. Um, it is listed on the National Register, as many of you know. Um, the way that we go about doing that is through education, is through outreach, and through civic involvement. This is our second public meeting, and we are excited to be talking about Cahaba Project architecture today. Um, so this is uh, an educational, and uh, I think if most of you live here in the project, you, you, you know your home pretty well, but there might be some things you learn about the features in your home and the neighborhood as a whole with our architect, uh, James Stransky, who grew up in the neighborhood, and um, I'll uh, let him introduce himself and a little bit more about his background, but he comes at, uh, th at, to his profession having the perspective of growing up in, in two of these homes, actually. We're also going to discuss property values in historic neighborhoods. And why they're unique. Um, real estate trends and the Cahaba project as an asset to the city of Trustville. So we're gonna start with Jamie and then we can open it up to questions and then I'll take it from there. And if you have to leave early or something, we are recording this, we'll make it visible, um, we'll make it shareable because this is really important content. So again, thanks for being here. Thank you, Amy, and thank you uh, for inviting me here to speak to the neighborhood. This isn't my normal thing. Um, I'm usually just helping people one-on-one -on -one in a very intimate situation, dealing with a personal issue that they're having with their home. They may need more space. They may need to grow their family. They may need to make it more livable for long-term. Uh, so I apologize if I'm not the best guest speaker, but I've worked with numerous people in the neighborhood. Some of them are here tonight. Um, I counted them up. I really don't stop and think about it, but. It's been like 25 different families that I've helped along the way. And it started out as just kind of a, a side project sort of thing, trying to help trustful residents do, hopefully do the right thing with their home. Because at the time I didn't um, see people using architects. It was kind of like a home designer here or there, or just winging it with a contractor, like, hey, I need an extra bedroom or whatnot. So, um, but my reason to be here tonight is not to promote what I do necessarily, but just talk about what you have and the value that you have in the home that you own and live in. 
and uh, hopefully can stay in for as long as you are here. I mean, I don't live in Trustful anymore, I, but I grew up here. I, I, my first home in Trustful, I was probably two or three. I was over here at 207 West Mall, just, just the other side of uh, Chothful Road. And then the remainder of my years, once my parents bought a home, was at 212 Lake Street as a corner lot a blue house and I'm going to come back to that and reference it in a lot large way just to, because I know that house almost better than any other house here. Um, it has a lot of the original details that I think should be and could be replicated in some of the newer homes and uh, remodeled homes that are here. Um, but I, I grew up here, like I said, I went to Hewitt Trustful High School, uh, graduated in 1993. Um, from there, I went straight to Auburn. You know, I might turn some people off by saying that, but that's the only place that had an architecture program, and I was interested in that. I, I grew up an Alabama fan, so if that helps with anybody. Um, since when I graduated in 1998 from Auburn, I went to work at a small residential firm over in Homewood, and I still am there. I'm just a creature of habit, I'm sorry, but I'm still there 20 um, some odd years later. Um, but I see a lot of people that are here that are probably creatures of habit too. They, they grew up here, they still live here, and I would live here too, but um, it just turned out I live in a great little place too called Avondale, and I've been there about 20 years now. Um, in addition to that, uh, living at Avondale, I'm on the design review board there. Um, I know you currently have some sort of design review board here. Um, Ours is set up, we have a historic district, both nationally and regionally and locally. Um, so um, I've been on that board another 15 or some odd years. So um, that doesn't necessarily give me any more uh, credit to you know, get up here and speak, but I was invited, so I'll, I'll just get going here. Good, thanks. Unfortunately, this may be too small to really see from some of the vantage points that you're at, but everybody here is probably familiar with these homes. You can see them from where you sit. You walked past them, you drove past them, you lived in them or live in them. Um, and what I have here shown is representative of many trustful styles of homes, because like I said, I helped a lot of homeowners in this neighborhood. And so I have a lot of these um, drawn in the computer or by hand, and I just put a, a smattering of them together to create this. It's kind of a generic street. It's not a real street here because we have, you know, the two-story homes that you see, like I can think of the cemetery house, you know, over here at Halloween that you're familiar with. My parents, 212 Lake Street, two-story two two house. Um, then, then a couple one-story houses that are just different. And then um, the, the mall homes that are duplexes. Uh, I didn't represent every house here. It was just, this is for more of a representation of what we have or what we have. Um, I'm gonna zoom in on some of this just to talk to, talk in um, specifics about what makes this house, these houses unique. I think everybody already knows um, in terms of value, that's uh, what's valuable to you is your memories probably here growing up here or the memories you plan to create here so um, that's the value that i speak to a lot with homeowners um, monetary value okay, historic oh, sorry i knew that was going to happen Yeah, that may be helpful. It's just, it may be helpful to pass some of these around because, but I do need to reference these other ones. I can pass these two around. Uh, again, this is just representing the houses that, I, that was showing them on their 100 foot lots, basically. Showing how far apart they're spaced, how the trees are very important to this whole landscape that we're um, placed in. The way the streets are on a grid pattern. Everybody's familiar with the, the advantages of this neighborhood, but I, you're more than welcome to pass these around and I, I will talk in terms of 
the details of these homes um, and try to stay focused on the architectural um, elements that are um, that are important here. We've lived in the homes. We might not know what it is that makes these homes special. And I'm, I'm not saying that just these things are special, but I'm trying to break it down in an architectural way so we can start to understand if we're going to take a house and tear it down in this neighborhood, or if we're gonna take a house and add on to it in this neighborhood, what, what pieces and parts of, of that are important to making it still feel like part of this neighborhood? And, and it's some things are written into the uh, code of trustful that, that says this is a special district and it needs special attention. And it says they're gonna focus on the roof styles, the types of windows, the materials. But then sometimes things get left out like scale, proportion, you know, um, roof pitch. You know, they say, but does anybody really know what the roof pitch is? If you're sitting in a, a meeting or something, does anybody know that it's that the only roof pitches in this neighborhood are between uh, an eight and 12 roof and a 10 and 12 roof? There's no 12 and 12 roofs. There's no six and 12 roofs like you'd see on a craftsman style home. There's no flat roofs. And you might ask yourself, why is that so? I, you know, uh, it's kind of indicative of this style. It's kind of, um, it, it, it's just, part of me wants to say that it's, it's government driven because the government built these homes. And it was at a time when this, this style sort of represented America, you know. Uh, the style itself is, uh, I want to make sure I'm accurate in this, but, um, but anyway, I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, the, what I was wanting to show with this and represent is you can tell that all these homes um, hover around 27 feet, 28 feet, the smaller homes at about 20 feet tall total. You know, I think that the regulations in trust will limit you to 35 foot uh, roof line. Well, we saw what happens with some of those homes that are just allowed to go up to that maximum, and that's what's gonna happen, because it's just natural. People have the room, they want the room. You know, they have the money, they want to spend the money. For some reason out there in this world, people want bigger. It, um, not everybody, but, um, but there's value in these. These are proportioned to the human scale of, of, of the people that lived in these homes. Now, I'm not saying that it's exactly proportioned to our lifestyle now, but, but what I also focus on is not just the ridge, but where the eave happens on the house, because that's really your face of the house. So the tallest eave on, on all these homes is 18 feet, you know? So, and that's these duplex homes here, from what I could gather. That's not taking into account topography or anything like that, but most of these lots around here are relatively flat. So I just wanted to put on paper, for my own sake as much as anybody else, just to be able to see, these are, these are where the homes reside in terms of scale for the neighborhood. So not saying we can't deviate from that, but we need some sort of governing rule as to what what is already here so that what comes next year, the year down the road, is, is in keeping with what's over here. So these are heights, and I am keep saying scale, but those are the heights of, of the, the neighborhood. And I'll, I'll pass that around too, and you can look at it. Um, garages are six and 12 rooms on those. They're typically behind the homes. People really can't see them. I've always been of the mindset that uh, what you see on the front is for the neighborhood. It's not really for you. You live in the home. You live in the back of the home. The front porch is your way to connect to the neighborhood. So I'll, that's my me personally talking. That's not anything that's set in stone. So I'm going to stick to try try to stick to the facts, and that's going to be hard here because I care so much about trust. Um, this is what I talked about in terms of roof slopes. So you can see these roof slopes, there's a lot of similarities. Some go as high as 12 and 10 and 12. And that just means like for every 10 feet you go up, you go 12 feet over. And, and same, I 
forgive me if I'm talking down to you, but I just didn't know if people understood what a roof slope was. So like an eight and 12, that's going up eight feet and going over 12 feet. And that's pretty comp, these are just common to these homes. So for instance, the, these, these homes have some nine and 12, nine and 12, eight and 12. I thought they were all the same at one time until I actually got up in the attics and measured some of them, so, uh, or a lot of them. So um, I just thought I'd share that with everybody. I can pass that around. So this, this one that's uh, shaded to some degree is, is just representing the proportions, you know, uh, and you may ask what's proportion. It's kind of like that, what I just said about the roof slope, but it's more or less, you know, is it a taller, skinnier home that's 35 feet tall, but only five feet wide, you know? But, but these homes, generally speaking, range anywhere from a one and a half to one proportion wider than it is tall to two and one, three and one, four and one. So they kind of do spread out. It's, there's a variety of proportions on these homes. So there's nothing really set in stone that says that one can, it must be this sort of proportion. So you can see it ranges again, two, two to one for the, the duplexes. And then the roof slopes are part of that. The roof slopes become a part, an element. It is a very important element in this town more than maybe most because that's one thing that helps unify a lot of these homes is this metal roof. And, and I think I was questioned why why they use the metal roof. I will defer back to Amy. I really don't know. And or somebody else here that's lived here. Maybe they know why they used the metal roofs at that period of time on these homes. They wanted to build these homes, I think, in a way that they'd last. And, and, the, and the local materials. And the local materials. Best best local materials. So and we already know they're mainly made up of brick and siding and shingles and, and in the wood uh, the, the roofs themselves are all metal uh, shingles but um, but again I just wanted to show that to everyone and let them have this as a reference point for going forward with whatever we decide is appropriate um, now I'm gonna uh, I, I talk to clients like this a lot and I say let's look at you look at your project look at your scenario general to specific there's the big picture you know how it sits on the site how it relates to the street how it relates to the backyard your setbacks and then you start working out the plan you figure out what people need and their relationships the circulation the views where the sun angles are where light comes into the home how you come into the home with groceries how where the kids sleep in relationship to the parents bedroom all those sort of things it gets very intimate really quick you can talk about bathroom arrangements who wants their toilet in a room of its own who doesn't you know um but but that's why i'm using my own house that i grew up in because again it's an intimate intimate relationship you you get with these homes and I'm not talking about just trustful, I'm saying any home you live in. And, uh, and I think that your home becomes your, at least for me, becomes the kind of backdrop, your safe zone, no place like home. You know, you've heard all the saying, home sweet home. So this is my parents' home. It, you may recognize it. It's on the corner over here of Lake and Rock Ridge. Um, but uh, my dad likes to say, he, when he painted the house blue, it was like, Everybody was upset that he painted the house blue. This was like 20, 30 years ago, but uh, I'm seeing more blue homes, so I guess <laughs> it's okay now. Um, so with this house, it's, it has a lot of similarities to a lot of these other houses, because some of the details are recreated over and over again. Um, again, it was a lot of homes built in basically two years or so. And so, and they wanted some sort of iconic way of tying all these homes together and giving people a sense. I may have stole this from some information I learned from something Gary wrote, but the whole concept of trustful was to make everybody feel the same. If you've ever had relationships with people in your life that might have different demographic backgrounds, may have more at their disposal to do things that they want, they can kind of 
friend and go to Disney World and you can't afford it. You can barely get peanut butter and jelly sandwiches together. This was a way, it was the Great Depression. Everybody was kind of suffering together at that point in time, trustful being one of them. So, so I think this was a way of making everybody feel a part of something bigger than themselves and part of something bigger than um, part of this country. You know, that's why these flag day was yesterday and I, I saw a picture that Amy was painting and uh, on Instagram and I was just, these houses were really just made to have an American flag hanging on them. I mean, they were made by the United States government for their people and what better way to show appreciation than hanging a flag. My dad keeps one flying all the time. You know, he's, he brags about it, he, but, but anyway, back to the facts. Um, I'm going to just go through some elements on the house. This particular home faces Lake Street, so it has a porch facing Lake Street, but it also faces Rockridge. There's a there's an element here on our house that I'll be honest with you, we never used that door that was here on this middle of the house. And there's several homes here that have that, but I drove rode my bike around like the old days looking for other homes like that. I found a couple of them, but not many, because they use this as the entrance a lot of times on these homes that are this style. But when my parents were forced to basically replace this door, I said, well, let me help you do it in a way that looks like something that they would have done at that time, you know, and be a part of the house. Now, you see some of these homes, they put a little gable roof on it because that's they got these little gable roofs, it makes sense, right? Um, to put a gable roof, plus it sheds the water away from the front door. But it was hard for me to let go of that childhood, of having that element there, that, um, that element. So all I did was increase that depth, kept the porch just like it was, and um, try to repeat some of these column features. And this is where I wanted to talk about the columns on this house, because I feel like I may be wrong, but this, this, the proportions of this column, I think, are closest to the original proportions that I could find. And um, maybe it's just because of how the house is maintained over the years, or we didn't necessarily have the budget growing up to change a lot of things. We didn't put Doric columns or round columns or fluted columns or big, now it's popular, I've seen people put these big cedar posts that I, I don't know where those are coming from. but. They're so foreign and, and not really meant for a home, but uh, of this stature. So these columns, you got your uh, capital. It's just representative of like a Greek column, basically, classically thinking about it. So you've got your capital piece, and it's built up of little pieces of trim on top of one by six material that form a box column. And the box column is made this way. It's basically four pieces that come together to create a, a box, all equidistant, and then they caulk the joint. On a, uh, it's called a butt joint. So instead of like mitering the corners like you see sometimes, it's just a butt joint because over time, that's going to weather and want to move and twist and uh, expand and contract with the season. So it needed to be done in a way that could be maintained. And it was very easy to maintain. It's basically a caulk joint couple rolls of paint and you're back to back to good um, there's little tiny pieces of molding that, that are mitered up at the top that kind of tile that back together again in a true column on, on a classical home like this and really every home a column is supposed to be in the same plane as this um, freeze board piece that's right here you see some that are tucked under you think none of this is supposed to stick out from from the face of that it, it's gonna get rotten right but, but that's that's traditionally how it's done. You can go over to Greece and see how it's done. You can go to Washington, D.C., see the Lincoln Memorial. You can go to the White House. That's how the columns are done. And that's how, if you're trying to keep with this style of home, that's really how they should be done still. Um, I'm not a classical architect. If you came into my firm where I work, I probably wouldn't go out of my way to just create homes that look like this in a, in a totally new way if I had, like, free reign, but it's all about context. We're in a, in a context here. We're not like just making up our own language. There's a language here. It's like I live in the United States of America 
and I, I speak English because that's the way I was raised. If I started just making up my own words, and before long, people tend to ignore you or they don't understand what you're trying to say. It might mean what, what you are t intending to say, but I mean, me even up here talking now, I'm probably not making sense, but, but I do want to go back to this and, um, and talk a little bit more about these details because on your own personal homes, you may have at one point put vinyl siding on it, or someone did, or metal siding because they're trying to preserve what they have. They're trying to lessen the maintenance of what they have. And so some of these details are probably under there. I have to tell people in Avondale all the time, it's like, don't be afraid to take off that siding because what's under there is probably in really good shape. It was probably just a little old lady that some salesman came along and said, hey, you'll never have to paint again. You never have to worry about your house again. This stuff will last forever. Yes, it does. Does it look good forever? Not really, but, but it also covers up a lot of these sort of details but these details are there. They're made to weather. This, this piece that looks like it's sitting out there and could easily rot off this house, it hasn't because it's flashed properly. It has flashing that goes across the top of that. The same with this piece. Now, the original one, that in part didn't rot off. It was down here where it was flashing up on the door off of this wooden, I mean, concrete stoop. So, so they knew what they were doing back back when they built these houses. They, they had the right details in mind. It just, they do need maintenance, but maintenance isn't bad. I feel like in a way it connects you to your home. And, and you know, the six over six windows. I know a lot of people probably don't have their original windows in their home anymore. I understand because of, you know, you know, the energy efficiency of these are very poor. But you lose a lot of energy through a window regardless of what kind of window you have. That's not going to save you a lot. I, I try to tell people nowadays in my community over in Avondale as well as here, if, if your windows are in decent shape, why yank them out? I mean, paint them, reglaze them, get them reglazed because at the end of the day, you, you're going to be replacing those windows that you replaced again in 30 years. These windows are here since 1930s. You're not going to find a window that's marketed out there that's going to last 60 years. Nobody's going to warrant it 80 years. I'm sorry, it's just not going to happen. You can get something in there, but it's just temporary things. Um, government codes require that on new construction. You can't go back and put single glazed windows in your home um, if you were building new. So sometimes you're forced to do things that you don't necessarily want to do or need to do but um, but in, in terms of this I just want to talk about these details if you see how this is coursed with the shingles see how it lines up with the head of this window and they're spaced so that it lines up with the bottom of this window see that little extra piece on the top of this window that's head flashing so that that protects any water that gets in behind these shingles and it comes out on top of that window rather than going into the window and rotting it. They're not relying on caulk alone. This little piece at the bottom, this, uh, this sill, that's, that's original. And then underneath it, there's a little piece of trim. The sill horns that stick out catch the vertical trim. Uh, always siding and whatnot, the trim needs to catch all your siding. I've seen it before where they use one by or thinner trim sidings protrude beyond it but it's meant to kind of kill all those elements and 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 keep this detail clean um lastly back to the columns well not lastly but back to the columns you can see how this column sits it, it has a base to it so it's a base to sh a shaft and a capital and and you find that on almost every column there is um, it's just sometimes people forget what was there or they don't know what was there. And that's, again, this is just representative of what was there and it's still there. And I think, uh, hopefully, that it will be here another 80 years or whatever. Um, but, but in this case, you can see how this column sits up. That piece of the, the column is actually a cast iron piece um, that holds that column up off the, the slab so that it doesn't rot. 
So if you get a new column that's wood and you set it right down on the concrete slab, there's no way for that to not rot. It'll want to wick water up. It's like a straw. If it's wood, it's like a straw. It'll want to pull moisture out of that slab right up into the column. It'll rot out a couple of years, especially with these newer woods that we have. Um, there's a lot of synthetic products, and if you're using lighter colored trims, you can use the, probably the PVCs and whatnot, but if you want to go dark, I recommend sticking with the natural materials. Um, one inch? A full one inch? It's, it's, I think what Bob's saying is that the newer wood, I, I, the newer wood's a little thinner. The older wood is a, a full one inch. Yeah, it's a one inch. So you can still get that. They call it five quarter. So it's five quarter rather than it's it's tricky. It's it's just like a two by four isn't two inches by four inches anymore. It's one and a half by three and a half inches. So um, I'm sorry front of the house is here as far as I grew up knowing it. This this face is Rock Ridge, so. This one? This one? Well, it's the widest face. You'd think that that would be the front of the house rather than the narrower face. But, uh, but I guess they chose Lake Street. I don't know who chose it, but somebody think, chose Lake Street. Think they <laughs> These little drawings I did years ago for my parents because they wanted to move out of Trust for 10 years. Their dream was to one day live on a lake they had property a long time. They wanted to live on a lake. So as an architect, their son was going to draw them this great house. And I was like, okay, I'll help you. I guess I should. I'm your son. So I started down that road and I just couldn't do it. So what I finally decided was for Christmas, I was just going to watercolor them their home so that they could kind of see it up close and in an intimate way. Even though they live in it, they don't recognize it and it hangs in their house now you know, because I thought they were moving, basically is what it came down to. And I said, you know what? They need something to take with them and, and, and go on and live the rest of their life the way they want to live it. Somebody else will take this house and do what they want with it. Um, I wasn't gonna buy it. It was too small for me and I already had my family in Avondale at the time. But um, that's, that's really um, why I'm here tonight is just, is I just want to share my love of this neighborhood. I don't live in it anymore, but my memories live in it. And I come here all the time. My parents still live in this house. Um, my kids still play in the yard. We still come here and ride bikes sometimes. I walk down to the Cobble River. We don't have the same downtown. We have no Hastings Drugs, no Braden's Furniture, no um, Glendale Mills, no Funville, no you know, none of the things maybe that I had growing up, but uh, but it, it has great things of its own right. I feel like it's got a piece of Avondale now going down here. Because where I live, I see things that I recognize. I heard melt was coming at one point. I don't know if they still are. But, uh, but anyway, I'm gonna quit talking because this is this is where I kind of end. But, but from there, I did wanna, so Jamie's got some more um, renderings here but they tie in really well to what I'm gonna uh, talk about so I'm gonna go ahead and jump ahead and because the cameras right here Jamie, do you mind scooching the the, sure. the whole shebang over so <laughs> I live in the project. Four out of the five of the officers of the Cahaba Homestead Heritage Foundation also live in the project. And uh, like you, probably, I've also been driving uh, around the neighborhood, walking around the neighborhood, and just noticing changes in the neighborhood. 
And as a homeowner, I'm wondering what that means. What does that mean for the neighborhood? What does that mean for myself as a property owner in the Cahaba project? What does that mean for Trustful? So if, if you've been wondering some of the same things, um, I, I hope that's one of the reasons that you, you came tonight. That is one of the reasons that uh, a group of neighbors got together to, found, to create this uh, foundation. And so we got, we hit the, gro uh, the ground running with research, and I'm really eager to share some of what we've learned through our research, through outreach to um, other towns in Alabama. Um, none of them are quite exactly like ours. We've got something really unique here. Economic developers, urban developers, architects, municipal attorneys, realtors in historic neighborhoods. We've been uh, doing a lot of research again, and I'm eager to share some of that. So I wanna jump right into just recap a little bit about the architecture. Um, the architecture here in the Cahaba Project is part of the Cahaba Project's visible history, right? It is the historic built environment. Uh, even though it's uh, experienced changes over time, naturally. Historic neighborhoods have a few things that are unique to them. Uh, that includes the Cahaba Project. They were designed with people in mind, right? So there's a certain scale to that. There are sidewalks. There's a walkability to it because they were designed with people in mind. Um, proximity to common areas like we have the tennis courts, to the school, to the parks, to, to our main street. The mature trees that you get that only really happen over time, if you've planted them, you know, when they were small, that comes with historic neighborhoods. The lot sizes very often tend to be a bit larger than you find in new construction neighborhoods. Here we've got something unique. Um, when I drive around other subdivisions in Trustville, um, you see sometimes uh, the cars are lining the streets. And here most people just park around the back. And so it, um, that, that sense of that parking doesn't disrupt the view as you're driving and walking down the street. There's something nice about that, to, uh, that aspect here in the neighborhood. Green spaces, that has to do with our setbacks and the size of our lot. So you get this flow of the house structure and then this green space in between, right? <clears throat> Great schools in our case, not every historic neighborhood can say that. And that's something that uh, right here changed, I think things dramatically for the neighborhood in 2016. It's one of the reasons that we decided to stay, my family decided to stay, because we're raising three children here in the neighborhood. You put all those things together and you've got a really desirable place to live. And all of you know that if you live here or you have lived here or you're considering living here. Trustful has that in general, but there's some unique aspects here in the Cahaba Project. So that architecture and the authenticity of that architecture is an asset to a historic neighborhood. I wanna talk a little bit about real estate trends in general. I'm not a realtor, but I've spoken with several real estate agents very recently. And, and you don't have to be a realtor to know that interest rates are down, home prices are up, construction prices are through the roof. And there's even a bit of a, there's a, not a bit, there's a housing crisis across the country because of that, um, those construction prices. There's also a shift there's a movement around cities towards downtown neighborhoods. The Cahaba Project in Trustville, it is the downtown neighborhood of Trustville. It's, the, it's in the center and it's the walking distance to Main Street. There's also a disenchantment with suburbia. That's been, that's, that's been a trend happening for the last 20 years or so. Look at, down, look at Birmingham, look at the lofts, people moving downtown, people choosing to, do with, to live with less not just millennials. I'll get a little bit into demographics here in a second, but choosing to live with less. People that are interested, I think of our um, Trustful's 2040 plan and this, um, this, this plan to, to keep growing and to continue to attract families, which I don't think is a difficult thing for Trustful to do right now. And I think it's a great thing for Trustful to do right now. But look at the people that are gonna be home buyers now and, and younger than myself, who did not come of age during the 80s, during our sort of American age of uh, decadence, as it were, people who are 
invested in sustainability, that's guiding their values. I talked to realtors in Forest Park and in historic neighborhoods in Birmingham. What they're seeing is that those young people with children moving into these smaller homes because they want the homes with character and they like the walkability to downtown. Again, that's, some, that's, that's what the Cahaba Project has. In addition, we have these large lots where a family can envision adding on so that their family can grow there. I remember when my dad drove through the neighborhood and he was in real estate and he said, uh, this looks like a great place to start a starter home and to move back to retire. And now, and I would say argu arguably because of the great school system, it's a great place to live to do everything in between those things. I have a little bit of perspective on that because my dad was born from the, just missed the greatest generation. He was of the silent generation. My mom was a baby boomer generation. My siblings and I are between Gen X and millennials. So we kind of span that, uh, that perspective through our, through our family. The realtors I spoke with in Forest Park in particular were pointing out that people are moving into that Forest Park because of, because of the historic homes. They said they're not moving in here to move into a brand new house. And some of the homes that were built there that were not of the same character and that tended to be larger than some of the original homes there ended up being the ones that were tougher to sell. The white elephants on the street is what he said. There's another, there's a realtor in Opelika that we uh, reached out to very early on. And this probably will not surprise you that the homes that were selling the best there in their historic neighborhood were the ones that were renovated inside. So they were modernized to meet people's, you know, modern 21st century standards. But the exterior remained the, the character of the era when the neighborhood was built. So it's a, it's a winning combination. That was very consistent across the board in our research. So character, architecture, aesthetics, the mature trees, we all recognize those things here. But I wanna pose the question, <clears throat> why do property values in historic neighborhoods appreciate faster at faster rates than they do in the market as a whole? There's some really interesting points here that I want you to just, again, maybe you already know this, and if, if you do, that's great. I'll just kind of repeat it for you because it bears repeating. There is an intrinsic value to a historic home. Sometimes we talk about an intrinsic value as a replacement value. What would it cost to replace that house? You can't really replace these because these homes were built with sturdier materials that were available at the time they were built that's no longer used in new construction. When we talk about gauge, we're talking about a thickness of gauge, right? There's, there, um, and the wood, old growth wood, it's not used anymore in, in the new construction. Even the you know, metal shingles, they make some, um, many of you, if you've done any work on your houses, you know that you've got some, some more modern day, um, you know, comparable uh, materials to work with. But with the historic home, there's no equation that says, oh, because your home's older than 50 years old, which by the way, makes it historic, that in and of itself, we're gonna add 10% or 15% onto that equation of your property value. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Where the value comes into a historic neighborhood is the composite value. So what's that based on? It's the sense of place and continuity created by compatible structures, compatible architecture. People will pay for the assurance that their home and the neighborhood where that home resides will not change dramatically over time. If you moved here, chances are you moved here because you liked it. That goes for any neighborhood. Investing in that home knowing this is gonna look more or less like this in 10 or 20 years. My lot's not gonna be subdivided. My neighbor's not, not gonna build a concrete cube next to me. That's investor confidence. Investor confidence stabilizes property values in a neighborhood. Just very simply, there's a reason that historic districts that have that stabilization resist fluctuations in the market over time. Because any market, look at look at right now, look at our the, the trends that we discussed, the interest rates, 
prices of construction, the home prices going up. I don't know how long that's going to last, but it's natural that pri uh, values are going to fluctuate with the market. Historic districts can maintain a more stable property value throughout those trends. Something unique to historic districts is how you can enhance the value of those properties. Landmarking, and we have some of that here in the Cahaba Project, right? The, the landmarks, the plaques that say, this is where you are and this is why it's historically significant. This is why it's important. So we've already got some of that going for us. We also happen to be on the National Registry already since 2006. Another way to reinforce the property values in a historic neighborhood are reintroducing some of the historic features to that neighborhood, and that could be in the form of streetlights. I've only lived here since 2013. My husband grew up here. We bought the house for my mother-in-law. So, I, But more importantly than that short, relatively short history, I've been talking to neighbors. And several times over the course of the last decades, bringing back the, the uh, street lights has come up. And I did not expect to have an example here today, but it showed up. Here it is. If you haven't seen, there's one at Heritage Hall. This, just another example of how you could reintroduce a historic feature to the project. These uh, street lights that were on concrete uh, poles, and I don't think they were lit very long, maybe in the first few years of the project, but they remained there through the 60s or so. And, and again, I just wanted, to, I did not expect to have an example here, but placing some of those would be a way to increase property value across the neighborhood. Enhancing existing features. We have a stone entrance, you know, beautiful stone entrance there at the gazebo by Veterans Memorial. Um, just again, one example of how that can reinforce the value. Just imagine a stone entrance at each of the four major entrances into the Cobber project. You already know you enter something special when you drive through the project, even if you don't live here. That's the sort of thing that would be another indication that you've entered something historic and something special. Just enhancing what's already here. Zoning, that's another one. Zoning is a way that municipalities all across you know, the, the, the country protect property values. That's done by our setbacks, that's done by our, <clears throat> our lots not being subdivided, and land use, right? Think of land use, uh, something commercial coming into the residential area, that would change things, or a condo being built within the, uh, within the Cahaba project. That changes everything from there too. So just to recap, talking about the character of the architecture, the aesthetics, the composite value of that character being carried throughout the neighborhood, the assurance that that could remain at least not unchanged, because let's be realistic, people are going to need to make changes. Some homes would have to be torn down inevitably. These are homes. They are not permanent structures. But we're talking when, when we're talking about character, let's think about that more as not unchanged, but reinvested in over time. Just like you have to reinvest in your property over time when you're maintaining your home or adding on to your home. So I wanted just to, to be, make that, that clear. But what are those things? Um, the composite value, the investor confidence, stabilization, reinforcing with landmarks and the, um, the enhanced historical features around the neighborhood that might be more landmarks, maybe even a statue recognizing someone prominent in the history of Trustville or the Cahaba Project right there so that you notice it as you're walking by, that increases property values. The green spaces we have uh, increase property values, and I'm thrilled that the city is, um, if you read the comprehensive plan, they're intent on protecting those. Protecting our natural resources as well. Not everyone can say they live right there in the, along the Cahaba River. We've got limited resources, natural resources, and we've got limited historical resources. We often refer to this, the Cobra Project, as a heritage resource. So what does that mean? I like to think of that as combining history and culture. So a heritage resource is one that really embodies both. Without the historic character, without reminders of the origin of the Cahaba Project, which, by the way, 
you know, the success of the Cahaba project is the reason the city of Trustville incorporated 10 years later. Without that, this is what one of the realtors was talking about in Homewood, you're just another neighborhood with a good school. Now maybe, maybe people are okay with that. You're also subject to fluctuations in the market without that sort of stabilized, um, stabilizing feature of compatibility within the neighborhood. And if, if our new construction in the neighborhood continues, and not just new construction in general, I'm specifically based on our research, I'm talking about out of character construction, then it is only a matter of time before that system gets tested, design review gets tested further, and you do end up living next to the person in the concrete cube. Again, if you're okay with that, okay. That's just, that is where the trend would go unchecked. And that would certainly, so then you, you get this maybe a bit of a hodgepodge. You don't have to imagine this, just drive through Crestline, drive through Homewood, drive through neighborhoods that were built around the same era, the 1930s like these homes were. This one, let me, let me go back to that point. The Cahaba Project has an opportunity to do something that those neighborhoods didn't. And I think they've got more of an incentive to do it. Because even though those homes were built with this kind of charm and the classic, timeless architectural features that we find so appealing here, they were not one of the resettlement communities built during the New Deal. I've heard in talking to neighbors, some people saying it's not really old enough. Our country's not that old. <laughs> Our country's not even 250 years old. The Cahaba Project is almost 100 years old. And it was built by the greatest generation. I get chill bumps when I say that. But let me get back to my points here. <laughs> I think we need to ask ourselves, what do we want the Cahaba Project to look like in 10 years and 20 years? You know, cities have to do that, communities have to do that periodically. Would we continue to just be another s suburb without a clear identity, without a clear visible history? Will we become basically East Birmingham? We're only 15 miles or so out of Birmingham. Will we, will we become that much of a, you know, just this blurred sort of no, no division, no clear identity, no sense of place? Or will Trustful retain its iconic historic character that it has here? Again, will the project just become another neighborhood with a good school? I mentioned Crestline before and Homewood, and it's not that those aren't desirable places to live, and I think if, because this is such a desirable place to be, because of the lots, because of the mature trees, because of downtown, because of the good schools, you could probably tear down every house in this neighborhood and still sell every lot. I really, do, I wouldn't stand up here and, and try to lie to your face to, to, to protect some kind of secret agenda. I'm not doing that. I don't, I don't think that that would be, it, I think that it would still be a desirable place to live. It just wouldn't be the Cahaba Project anymore. It wouldn't be the New Deal community that was the reason that Trustville incorporated as a city in 1947. It wouldn't be that. Without it, Trustville would also be what? Just another city with a nice, attractive downtown, don't get me wrong, but any city can do that. Any city can attract businesses to their downtown. Any, people, any city can attract families to their neighborhoods and great teachers to their schools, but no city can duplicate another city's historic resources. That is the one thing that Trustful has that no one else can duplicate. That is Trustful's competitive edge. That is the thing that can carry Trustful into the future, defining it, showing that we are, we are invested in our past, we're invested in our future because we're growing with some kind of direction. That's a point I wanted to bring up. Downtown is a great example of that. I think what they're doing is gonna be really successful. I think it already is. Design review governs commercial, uh, our design review here at Trustful governs the commercial construction and the Cahaba project construction. But they have firmer design standards downtown. There's a historic overlay downtown. 
Why do they have firmer design standards in place for commercial construction? Because they know it's good for business. It is no different with residential architecture. Some 20 years ago, the city council enacted a rezoning for the Cahaba project that would protect its character in the same way that the city has prioritized correct, uh, protecting the character of downtown. But it was never rezoned to that. That's section 30.0 in planning and zoning. It's over 20 years on the books, but not effectual. There are ways to accomplish historic district protections locally. And that's another thing that we've obviously been doing research on. I do think it's worth noting that this is the first time in Trustville's history that there is no sitting um, member of city council or the mayor that lives in the Cahaba project. So we don't exactly have that voice at the table right now for Trustville's oldest neighborhood. But we do have a voice, we're here today. We're getting the conversation going because I think it's really important to ask ourselves, what do we want it to look like 10, 20 years from now? And because of the changes, and change is inevitable, but given the changes that we're seeing now, without clear direction with where it's going, and that's the key, I think, without clear direction, that is why neighbors came together with a sense of urgency for promoting, perpetuating, enhancing the value, the great value that we have within the community. In 2006, when the, when the neighborhood was put on the National Register, there were 13 out of 273 homes or structures. You count two, of course, in the duplex, but 13 out of 273 were considered non-contributing. And only one of those at the time was a one of the original Cahaba Project homes. Most of them were the ones built in the 50s and 60s and 70s because, of course, you know, not every lot was filled when, when the neighborhood was built in 36, 37, 38. So some of those homes came later. Um, even if you, if you estimate us now being at 20 or so out of 30 that would not fit the National Register um, criteria, we're still at 90% intact. 90%. This is not the only thing that the Cahaba Homestead Heritage Foundation is about, but it's been a big part of our research because without maintaining the character of the neighborhood, I, I don't know what we're, we would be investing in just the history that's in a book, you know? Um, not a living history or a visible history around us. Um, we're looking forward to the centennial, the Cahaba Project in 15 years. That gives us a lot of time to plan. <laughs> and. Uh, We'd like to bring back, there, I, I heard that there were Heritage Days, and that's something we've talked about bringing back as an annual event. That would be a communi community-oriented event. Um, we've talked about establishing a house museum out of one of the existing Cahaba Project homes um, that would be an educational resource. You know, kids and teachers can come over from the school and tour the house when they're learning about Alabama history, when they're learning about the... Um, the uh, national history, the, the, the 30s, the Depression, the wartime. And also, it opens the door for uh, heritage visitors that are driving through. People already love walking through and driving through that don't live here just to enjoy the atmosphere and the space, the sense of place that is unique here. And um, we've got, what we're, when we have an indoor meeting, we'll be able to play a clip from a librarian at the um, another, um, a, not a librarian, but a curator at the House Museum. And it's exciting to think about the potential that we could um, could have one of those here. And something that, uh, uh, that would be an entity that could reach out to Heritage Hall and work hand in hand. And we as a foundation look forward to working with the Historical Society and the Historical Board. We know we're not, we're not reinventing the wheel here. We're just, I think we're, we're, we are more specifically about the Cahaba Homestead Village or the Cahaba Project. <laughs> 